Hey there, Dr. Alan Christensen here with you. I want to talk about Hashimoto's and fertility. So this is an important topic because so many women today are struggling with fertility. We see this being a bigger concern. And some researchers almost put this off or some writers put this off saying that women are just waiting too long to have babies. Well, it's true that women do wait longer than they did in the past, but strong data has shown that even when they don't, there still are more struggles with fertility. Thyroid disease can be one of those causes, and Hashimoto's can affect fertility even before it shuts down the thyroid. Along the same line of evidence, we're also seeing that males have much lower rates of fertility. In fact, sperm counts among males have been plummeting dramatically over the last few decades. If the trend continues, arguably within a decade, we will be an infertile species. We will not be able to have babies the old-fashioned way at all. So it's a big shift, and thyroid disease may be part of that. Now, the fascinating parts are that there's classic hypothyroidism, where the gland is really shut down, TSH goes through the roof, and the free hormones plummet. So you don't have to be there to have your thyroid impact your fertility. And more and more fertility specialists, they're aware of that. What we see is that when the TSH is greater than two, that alone may be a factor impairing fertility. So many women who are struggling with fertility, important to screen. And that may be a scenario to where you would consider thyroid replacement even short term, even if you wouldn't have a strong need for it otherwise, just to keep the TSH below that target. Now fertility has also been a fascinating topic because we've seen that thyroid antibodies being elevated, TPO or thyroglobulin, even if the TSH is below two, and even if all other thyroid markers are perfect, that high amount of thyroid antibodies, that may impair fertility. So this is important all to itself for fertility, but it's also important to demonstrate the fact that thyroid antibodies are not harmless. You know, many doctors ignore thyroid antibodies unless the thyroid is shut down. They say, oh, they're not important. They're clearly affecting our bodies in some way if they're stopping fertility. And that's not likely the only thing that they're doing. So part of managing fertility, also critical to manage thyroid antibodies. And steps for that, first one is just good control of TSH. Also for those who are on replacement, desiccated thyroid can by itself diminish the antibody load and cause that to go lower. Also all the other steps of being on the best diet, detoxing the body, managing the rhythm, rhythms, lowering the immune stressors, these are all big factors for that. So a few more thoughts about this. There's been a lot of data about T2 affecting fertility. Now T2 is one of the three active thyroid hormones, but it's one you don't hear about all that much. We hear a lot about T4, T3, but there's been data saying that T2 is maybe one of the most important ones that talks to the ovaries. Not that I'm actually pointing to ovaries, but it's the one that really activates them and affects their production of progesterone. And large bodies of data have shown that a good second cycle phase of progesterone production is critical both for initially conceiving, but then also for retaining pregnancy during that first trimester, which can be a more difficult time for it. We've also seen data amongst males saying that T4 total can be a factor affecting sperm count and motility. So this is another important recurrent theme and just a big overarching concept is that we do need T4. There are some advocates who are saying you only need T3 because it's more active in some ways than T4. It is more active in some ways than T4, but there are many cases to where your body needs T4 all by itself along with T3. And the big overarching concept is that you want to really mimic the state the body would be in if it were in good health. And when we're healthy, we've got T4, T3, and T2. So how do you get all of those? Well, really desiccated thyroid is the main way if someone is on replacement. If they are clearly hypothyroid and underproducing, desiccated thyroid is still the sole source of thyroid that includes all three of those medications. Other factors to think about with fertility, you know, hormones are so central. So the cortisol rhythm. And data supports that, that even if you're not Cushing's where you're, where you're making way too much cortisol or Addison's you're making way too little, that your cortisol cycle does affect fertility. So do a salivary four-point cortisol assay. If it's not good, do a simple thing like carb cycling to help get that back into place again. The adrenals also affect the androgen output amongst women. 
So how much testosterone, how much DHEA a woman's body makes is largely governed by her adrenal health. And we know that PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, is a state of high androgen output. And that overlaps with Hashimoto's and can also be a big block towards fertility. Many nutrients are also relevant. Uh, zinc can be a big one. Many times when I'll test a woman, I'll see that she may be low in zinc. It's a hard nutrient to absorb. Sometimes taking a multi is not enough to assure good zinc status, nor, nor is it a good diet. If it is low, it may take higher amounts taken by itself for a period of time or intravenous versions of that. But simple things like zinc deficiency, essential fatty acid deficiency, vitamin D levels being too low, amino acid status, proteins being lacking. These are all big things that can affect fertility, as can gut flora. So a big variety of fibers is important. But big picture, yes, strong link with Hashimoto's infertility and a strong case study about how optimal is more important than normal for TSH scores and how antibodies are important all to themselves for many facets of health. Dr. Christensen here with you. Take great care. We'll talk in really soon. Bye-bye.